Yeah. Anyway, um, I, I note that uh, Mary is a, or she will obviously mention this herself, but she's a Combumera person through her father's side with affiliations with the Waka Waka uh, people through her mother's side. She uh, has worked across several government agencies and organizations, uh, community services, Aboriginal Islander childcare agencies, and worked with the University of Queensland uh, Foundation for Aboriginal and Islander Research. Um, also, she's a lecturer with the University of Queensland teaching Aboriginal history, politics and comparative philosophy. So I hope she is with us. We're very lucky to have her. She is an Indigenous elder, but she is um, able to present her uh, perspective on the nature of um, uh, economics, which fundamentally, as I said initially, of course, is something humanity creates. We socially uh, create the economy is something that we have made. And uh, I think that uh, um, her talk will be very useful uh, in extending our uh, understanding of this, the nature of this. So. Ah, okay. right. oh, there we are, Mary, I can see you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So welcome, uh, and um, I'll, I'll hand over to you, and uh, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much. Um, I found that fascinating, actually, <laughs> Stephen talking about the, about, I didn't understand fully all the, you know, the economic terms and things like that, but it made me start to wonder about things like um, how act actually economics actually started, you know, where, where, where did it, how did, how and when did it arise? Did it arise with trade and barter or did it arise with um, coin, you know, the invention of coins and, and of course the invention of banks themselves uh, for the Italians, apparently, and from what I read, they invented the idea of banks and stuff. And, and it just, uh, just made me wonder about a whole lot of things and, um, that would that would have been great hearing a uh, talk by him uh, on a bit like by himself, you know, so we could everybody could ask questions and, and so on, or in a live session or something like that. But yeah, lo lots of things. And and um, he's saying uh, ecological economics is is the way to go, the best model, eh? Um, and so on. And uh, who was that? That was um, before uh, someone was saying. Was it Hayden? Was it Hayden? That was Phil. Phil. Well, we had Phil, both. Yeah. And, that's right. And yeah, someone. Phil Lawn. Phil Lawn. Yeah, that's right. Very, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, but um, yes. Yeah, so uh, I guess where I come into it, uh, well, where Aboriginal um, uh, models, if you like, <laughs> it's a very old model, of course, um, and um, I suppose in a sense, um, I would probably start off by. Say, for example, introducing myself from as coming from a particular place or a place in the locality and land. Um, my father's people here on the Gold Coast, this is his mob, you know, from here, the Yugan Bear speaking, language speaking mob of Combermary. And my mother is Waka Waka from the Bernard River District, further up uh, the coast and in the country. Um, but so, so place is extremely important for Aboriginal people all over the whole country and in meaning of life stuff too, of course. Um, but um, it, it comes back to the only thing that I've always had my, not doubts or uh, concerns with about economics itself, is that it's about systems, but somehow people are kind of left out of it a bit. You know, um, and and to us, uh, to Aboriginal people, but lots of Indigenous people around the world, of course, uh, and lots of people, of course. But um, but the the groundwork, if you like, is the is relationalism and survivalism, the two things that are intermingled with each other. They 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 are entangled with each other, and it's an everyday thing. It's an all day, every day thing of action and being in the world with other people, but also with non-human um, uh, life forms and, and so on and so on. And every bit of, uh, every life form that exists is about uh, relationalism and survivalism too. 
actually. So to me, uh, I couldn't help thinking, this is a while ago, quite a while ago, that economics strikes me as an essentially uh, more survivalist ethos than relational, than the relational. It's, if it is relational, it's about, um, if it is a relational thing, uh, of course it is about families, families that have to survive, you know, uh, jobs, uh, activity, trade, name it what it is, ancient and modern and so on. Um, but uh, more than anything, it's the human beings with, it, with economic, economics, with coin, with currency, with all these other things that have been invented essentially and survivalism um i could all you know i can't make this argument because i don't know economics that much you know that, that well but it strikes me that it that it's almost as if a form of a different form of survivalism or survivalist ethos comes in with the invention of economics the gradual development i should say of economics it's you have to you have to like for for example um you can look at it from an ancient point of view, the ancient point of view, when large agriculture starts, you know, big agriculture. Uh, Aboriginal people didn't have big agriculture. They only had small scale agriculture like Bruce Pascoe, Bill Gamage, the, those writers who talk about how Aboriginal people actually literally ran the country, you know, in detail. Um, but when, when it starts, big agriculture, around about 10 or 12,000 years ago, and it starts in those other ancient, place ancient civilizations of course the middle east and india china and so on um and uh they need things like um like for example wheels uh wheeled vehicles to bring um goods uh sorry produce but then goods to to a certain place they have to sort it count it and record it and so on so writing starts there too and writing is a catalyst sort of it it starts everything everything else you know uh, all over the world but, but that writing starts in those places also you know so a lot of human development over time and a lot of it turns into straightforward survivalism because uh what starts with large-scale agriculture is of course um competitiveness and which means wars they might have been small scale before like small scale um um uh, systems, governance systems, but after large-scale agriculture comes into it and people start competing, well, these these systems, structural political systems, become rigidly hierarchical. They're not just small, loose kind of um, structures, but rigid, and they start competing it for real, you know, in a real dangerous sort of way, big wars, small wars turn into big wars because people are trying to take over other people's country and and their goods, uh, sorry, and their um, good lands and, and so on, and have access to the best water and so on and so on. Aboriginal people never did that. They, they just simply never invaded other people's countries. They had, in a sense, uh, um, an ecological economic system way back then of collaboration between, over, res, over, over management of resources, collaborating, uh, ma managing resources and the uh, sharing of resources. So they learned to get, it didn't get rid of um, conflict between Aboriginal groups, of course, but, um, but it prevented going that one further step into invading other people's place. Because once you have invasion, once, a, once one country invades another, that's the end of security. And that's the only thing that, uh, that's all, sorry, that's another main thing that I worry about with the whole thing of the development of economics. It's like as if economic, uh, um, of uh, security and stability seem to go out. You have stability mainly, mainly in the economics itself, like the, the, all the detail of it, like Stephen was talking about. You may, you may have that. But all it, all it takes is for something humongously chaotic or upsetting, like, uh, like he was just saying, the virus. Um, and throughout history, it's wars, you know, and so on. All it takes is for that to not bring, thing, bring things to a halt, but to wound that system. And they take a long time to get back into place, you know. So just 
not not as a, a, an objection or a, um, criti criti criticism or anything like that, but to take into account the whole, whole idea of relationalism and a relationalist ethos, which is an added term. So relationalism is just everyday relationalism. It's familial, it's social, um, it's social even to do with enemies actually, too, um, relationalism. Uh, and of course, relationalism between human and other than human life forms, you know, other life forms and so on. Um, but um, but um, so while that goes on, um, un unlike in a, um, I'm sorry, train of my thought here but what i what i'm getting to I, I guess is the idea of a steady state economy um i said this the last time is uh, i can't help i couldn't help thinking given our sort of approach to society you know political and social ordering and and, and so on is that a steady state economics uh, requires a steady state kind of society Otherwise, it's given over to not real uh, steady state, um, not not the genuine article of steady stateness. Um, I think of terms of, if, if you don't mind, of a hypothetical like um, everybody knows the history of um, the uh, Titanic, <laughs> Titan the Titanic, um, greatest and believably uh, for its time, you know, it. Um, um, built um vessel you know huge incredible um and it would would have been like the ship to end all ships or something like that you know it, nothing was as good as that and so on and so on and it reminds me of um uh, even modern uh, technology today too you know the difficulties of um uh in another way of ai and stuff. anyway back to the titanic so it's it's can take thousands of people apparently um, but it's brought down, that is sunk by an underground, um, it runs into a, uh, what do you call it, um, iceberg? Is it an iceberg or something like that? But underneath, underneath the water, can't see it. And it takes a while, quite a while, you know, to, to sink. Um, and I'm thinking of that in terms of, um, if you can imagine such a, a strange, a strange object, an, an Aboriginal built, um, Titanic, you know? An Aboriginal built Titanic would have, would be a, a steady state system. In other words, it would um, maybe run into icebergs or be drowned, uh, you know, sink for other, other reasons, uh, but it would right itself. It would stay there. It would, it would just keep going. And as, you know, sailing around, sailing around, um, uh, because it couldn't stay still, and people often mistake Aboriginal society as being completely like it, it never developed or something like that. And of course, it developed because the development was sourced inland, in, inland, inland, inside actually, inside human development. You know, how to become more and more human, actually, not post human, but how to become more and more human. And you learn that with this relationship with the environment, with the ecology. So it's a bit like this. If you wanted to sum it up in a small uh, meaning, um, a sacralized um, ecological collaborative uh, stewardship system. That's what it actually is. And it's done in such a way that it lasts forever, for a very long time. So just imagine a, 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 a Titanic that lasts for tens of thousands of years. The inside of it would be completely different. I don't know much about the engineering and stuff like that, but. Um, it certainly would be run along the lines of uh, um, uh, the law of obligation. There wouldn't have been ever a class system. Everybody would be the same, but you'd have knowledgeable people, techno, te technological people, um, practical people, all the knowledgeable people would be running that ship. Um, and you, you wouldn't have, uh, you know, there wouldn't be any such thing as only the poor people in the bottom, uh, I forget what you call it, you know, in the bottom of the ship um, and the, and the well off in the top in the best place <laughs> that would, that wouldn't happen at all. You know? And they, they, it'd be built according to taking into account the surrounding, um, environment, which, you know, the water, the sea. And so on. Anyway, all that kind of stuff. Um, 
so I, I, I'm trying to get back to this idea of um, uh, what steady state can be, what it really is. It's, it's about the relations between people and land and the, then the relations between people. And I said, well, I'm not saying relations as in good relationship, like um, we all join hands and sing Kumbaya, I'm not talking about that. <laughs> I'm talking about what the essence of relationality and relationalism is. So you have that between people and between the uh, environment and the one between people, the system between people has to, has to be um, influenced mostly by the relationship between people and land. So land, the, the earth comes first above all everything else. And that, that way people end up with having the idea of ethics as a doing thing. It's a do, it's not just some high ideal that we all aim for. It's an actual doing practical active thing that you put into place into the social and political ordering. Because this is the other thing that worries me about economics is, um, is um, who runs society, you know, who runs, what kind of people could, could we, anybody say it's their knowledgeable people, <laughs> the leaders of countries today, or the uh, systems, the actual systems, are they knowledgeable? Are they knowledgeable enough to have um, not only a, a system of the law of obligation, but also of ecological economics? Are they knowledgeable enough? You know, are they, and this is the, um, the, chaotic unreliability of human beings and human organization. That's all, that's what worries me about trying to aim for the best model and so on. Um, uh, because people are, people are ornery. I'm, I'm talking about Aboriginal people too, even in traditional times, um, that while they didn't have a concept of invasion, you know, and they, you just simply didn't do that. It was un, incomprehensible to invade other people's country because the land creates humans, you know, so you can't go around invading other people's countries. So country is a, is a, a sacralized thing, you know, of land, of, of itself. But, so you can't go around doing that. But occasionally they'd have um, conflict. Conflict would happen, definitely. You'd have traditional enemies even, you know. Um, so humans, all, all generally, globally, uh, they can be really smart and clever and wise and all that, but they can also be ornery you know, really contradictory, so contradictory that if they're not having conflict, they'll invent something to have conflict about, you know, and I'm going with Aboriginal people like this too, you know, fighting over all kinds of stupid things. Um, so, so you have to have a, um, a system, a, a social and political system, um, ordering system and Aboriginal, the Aboriginal system has been called by good friend of mine, it's a long-term experiment in human order making. It's exactly what the Aboriginal system is, a long-term experiment in human order making. And they started off with land, of course, uh, of the care of land. And not just because the land needs care, of course, as we all know, the, the earth, the environment doesn't need people at all, you know. Um, we can disappear in a puff of smoke and it would just carry on. Um, but we are teaching ourselves it via this a loop, a roundabout loop, uh, ourselves ethics when we're looking after land. So it's not like having a, a great ideal up there and you teach people. And of course, as adults, you, you do teach young people, of course, young little kids and, and so on and so on. But we are teaching ourselves how to have a, a, an ethical system, law of obligation, um, autonomous regard, um, custodial ethic, those things have to be practiced in order to be in embedded and you know embedded in people so you you it becomes a habit actually um and it is a meaning of life so uh land doesn't just look after us it's not just a resource that we um we mustn't fight over we have to collaborate over and so on so all those sorts of things i, I just wonder about the whole of economics no matter what kind of want but the closest thing to it it looks like, you know, is ecological. It has to start, has to start off with the ecology, um, the land um, in a, um, a, a, a system, which I, I should have showed here, actually. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't think. Um, it shows the land in the middle. It's there for meaning of life stuff, for continuity,
for all kinds of stuff, for just life itself. Um, and all around are these various um, like attributes, like autonomy is extremely important. So no class or caste system. Uh, balance, ma uh, gender balance, a gender balanced government governance. You have to have that, you know, the old um, saying about two heads are better than one, you know. Well, it's better that one of them is female. You know, one of those two heads is female. They run society, not in a hierarchy. Um, and uh, so don't have hierarchies. You know what I mean? We would say, from our point of view, don't have a hierarchy. Because it seems as if, going back to this ancient system of um, uh, uh, where, where agriculture comes in and, and money comes, funds come in, you know, and hierarchies come in, rigid hierarchies. But also, they invent the state. They have to invent a state, a state with a small s, you know, not the nation state, which is only a few hundred years old, but the ancient idea of a state. So, ancient civilizations, pharaohs in Egypt, Persian empires, empires of all sorts, ancient ones, you know, Chinese, of course, um, ones in, um, even in um, South America, um, the Roman Empire, the British, so on and so on. So, on. Um, so they become huge, hierarchical, very, very competitive, and quite often run by people who are definitely not knowledgeable, you know. Um, so, um, all of that has impact on economics, I would imagine. And economics uh, is, becomes not only um, uh, a part of it, it becomes, it can become, and is at the moment, I would say, for, uh, uh, according to what goes on in the country, the various, the latest uh, war, you know, it could end up being the latest war to end all wars. You know, we're running that kind of risk. So, so economics is weaponized actually too. That's why we need a different system. That's why I think anything to do with environmentalism, environmental saving it, and economics has to take into account what kind of political and, and uh, political system, political uh, and social system that we have. So people have to start looking at trying to start something different without a revolution either, because quite often a re revolution, uh, even though I, I agree with the, um, what do you call them, the um, Extinction Rebellion people, they're, they're very brave. And, and the, all of these young people who are pleading with the people who are supposed to be knowledgeable running countries um, to try and take care of their future, you know, but nobody seems to be listening, of course. So it really does need a different system, political system, and, and something, and I know there's lots of brilliant people around the world trying to do this too. Sortition, you've, I don't know if you've heard of the system of sortition, which is an ancient Greek thing actually. Um, because, you know, they were small societies too in Greece, you know, when they started democracy. Well, Aboriginal system is a small society too. It's probably easier to do it. Sortition is like people's, um, assemblies or citizens assemblies and they're uh, from what i read uh, the different people around the world in different countries are experimenting with that it's trying to from their argument it's trying to bring democracy back to the local you know not just look at democracy as this i'm sorry to say if it's offense people um if um that people um it, it's a it's a front end system so it's, it's, all, it's supposed to be all great to vote, have the right to vote, the freedom and so on and so on. But the back end, the back end is too often millions of people who are homeless. You know, why are they homeless and living on the streets and so on and so on? How come democracy doesn't take care of those people? And I always thought it would be very interesting to ask those people who live on the streets in tents and all that, all over the world, you know, not in, in Western countries I'm talking about too, the numbers of uh, food banks spiraling, going out, ask them what they think of democracy. It would be wonderful to do a survey like that. <laughs> um, and um, just, and again, back to the idea of economics being weaponized currently. But, but perhaps these are some of the things I would have loved to talk more uh, to Stephen or ha have him talk about, you know, does, you know, how is it that economics can be, uh, how does that work? And how, do, how can you reverse that? The, the, um, the weaponizability of economics, you know, uh, and so on. Um, and in, in the end, um, I was going to say about people everywhere, 
Western, non-Western, you know, global South, everybody, Indigenous people in all these different countries, they always look for the kind of system, a political system, uh, that they want to and need to have confidence in. If that confidence in the system starts to sink down or crack up, then then you're into really bad bad problems. Then then that Titanic will definitely sink. But if you don't, if you don't, if you have a better kind of um, uh, made Titanic, uh, better made um, system of of ordering, a system of ordering, a social and political system of ordering, it can last for a very long time. And and I, I'm not disagreeing with the ecological economics. Uh, I think uh, I saw that um, a system uh, where it, it answered, it ticked all the boxes anyway, which is good, which is, which is very good. But I would also still say, try and look at relationalism and, and survivalism, have a relationalist ethos, like the law of obligation. And it's not as if it would be a completely foreign thing for the West, you know, Western countries. Um, uh, I always use it as an example, the National Health Service, invented by the English, um, a Welshman actually, apparently, uh, a Welsh uh, Prime Minister apparently, um, National Health Service, um, which is in most countries now, most Western countries have some form, all except America, you know, and nobody wants to go that American way with that, that kind of non-existent healthcare exist, uh, system they have. Um, but yes, that's, that's a law of obligation. Um, you know, very good quality health care for everybody and free. Doesn't matter what caste or uh, cl what class you were, you know, working class, rich, whatever, uh, and very good quality health care and free. That's, that is, in a, in a nutshell, uh, the law of obligation from a non-Aboriginal example. <laughs> um, things like little, uh, so, so it all comes back to policy making, I suppose, too, you know. Policy making has to have, start having an underlying foundational kind of uh, system, uh, which is like um, a, a custodial ethic, like a, a obligation, you know. And it's not as if, again, obligation isn't, um, a, is a foreign thing to um, Western, say, philosophy or anything. It's there in Greek philosophy and in Roman law, apparently, too. It's mentioned the, the importance of obligation to the society and so on and so on. So it has to be big, built up bigger and much bigger and foundational to government. Um, and, and that's the only other thing I'd, all, I'd say about EE, e, you know, ecological economics. Try to build that up, the system of how you're going to do it, econo uh, sorry, um, politically. Politically, how is it done? done? Because you've got to, you know, um, you know uh, revolution is, um, uh, is par se now. You know, it, it costs too much. Um, capitalism, you know, uh, I know some brilliant minds have um, tried very hard, uh, Western minds too, um, have tried to civilize, how to, how to civilize <laughs> um, capitalism, how to make it less savage and so on. How do you do that? You know? So, I don't know, I think I'll, I'll, probably, I'll probably leave it there. Um, knowledgeable people, law of obligation, relationalism, relational ethos, um, and, uh, and the survivalist, I should have said, the survivalist, survivalism is everywhere too. You've got to be careful about crossing the road, you don't, don't get hit by a bus. Um, what you eat, you know, watch what you eat in ancient times and right now too, in a restaurant or whatever. Um, um, what else? Um, uh, yeah, you, well, we're, we're living in it, isn't it? Isn't it? You know, the whole idea of the um, uh, COVID and so on. You've got to be careful what you do and where you go and so on and so on. But a, a survivalist ethos says that, and this is, I think, has happened in lots of cultures, I think, uh, too. A survivalist ethos says that you see the world as a dog eat dog world. It's a, it's a water is full of sharks. You know, all these sayings that you know of. Uh, look after number one. Don't bother about anybody else. In other words, a um, what I call what I don't call it this, but I saw this term uh, when my, when the people in the polit politics were discussing the or the overseas the global problems, uh, the term of indivisibility of security. People, you, and a, a, a 
uh, survivalist ethos leads to this, whereby you look after your own security at the expense of others. And that is something that Aboriginal people never did, you see, that, that goes against that law of obligation. So, you know, the great old Murray Darling, you know, it's over a thousand miles long, I think, if not the Um Dozens of different groups living along it, but they collaborated in, 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 in managing the resources of that place. That's why it never ran out of water or never a, a natural kind of systems, yes, but not from man made sort of uh, neglect. Or, so, so, collaboration, obligation, uh, and especially that indivisibility of security. Think of that, not just in military terms, in war making terms. But uh, one country, one people, one country, clan, a family for that matter, you know, the 1% uh, families kind of I'm talking about, who uh, all the security in the world is there for them, not for those ones that are living on the streets, you know, uh, and that, you know, that's got to change, disappear, actually. That's it. So I'll leave it there. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mary. Um, I a lot of food for thought, and I've seen in the comments a lot of positive uh, comments. So of course, I think it's very obvious that we have a lot to learn from uh, the perspective that you've uh, exposed us to, um, and the relational um, aspect and uh, the notion of the uh, obligation, which I think is what we're trying to get to, as often we talk about um, how uh, Aboriginal people um, uh, have a, an approach to being a custodians, not exploiters. <laughs> yes. Custodians, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that's what it is. Custodians and, and stewards, you know, stewards of the, of the globe, actually, of the whole globe, you know. And yes, that's yes. what kids should be learning.